Uh, thank you uh, for coming along tonight. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to... Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, um, things in conjunction with the uh, exhibition upstairs. And um, what I've decided to do, the, an exhibition and the brief that I have from the, uh, the art gallery is to talk about uh, place and uh, inspiration and landscape. And so what I thought I would do is uh, I'd like to, in the next... Uh, half hour is is tell a story, and I hope that in the story uh, those themes are covered. Uh, they might not be, in which case you've just heard a story, um, but they might um, somehow flick on to the things that I'm supposed to be talking about, and um, in a way it reflects the songs that I write and the uh, the art that I do. Um, in which I don't uh, try to jam or put themes into what I do and I just hope they're implied and people find them without too much um, uh, pre-thought from myself. They just appear. And so I'm hoping the same thing is going to happen tonight with the story I'm going to tell you. Uh, the story um, begins in, in the 80s, which is when I started to come down to Sydney uh, for the first time. I was born in Brisbane, and uh, the band I was in, the go Between, started in Brisbane. I've flown down from Brisbane today, and the band, the go Betweens, uh, which I was in, was, um, we played in, in Sydney. We started to play here more often in the 1980s. We played all the, all the way through um, the 80s, we, we were living from 1982 to 1987 in London. We toured around the world. We made albums overseas and we'd come to Australia every year, 18 months, and we'd tour and we'd play. And we'd always uh, play Sydney and we'd spend some time uh, in the city. In uh, early 1988, we actually came to Sydney to live. And we came here to make an album. And I moved into, I guess, a, a terraced house in Woolloomooloo, uh, which uh, down, down there, uh, in a, I think the street is called Broughton Street. And I lived there in early 1988. And I used to come up here. I used to walk up here, which was the first time I'd ever been to the gallery. And it was the first time in my life that I'd actually lived near a gallery. Because normally when I had to, if I wanted to go to a gallery, I had to go by train, by bus or drive there. But this one I could actually, it was like a 10-minute walk uh, up here. So I used to uh, come here and I used to spend a lot of time in that room over there, the 19th century uh, art world, um, which I enjoyed the most, which touched me the most, which reached me the most. And I was particularly taken by some paintings by uh, Sidney Long. And uh, I discovered that he, he was an artist that vaguely was in an art movement called the, the Symbolist uh, uh, Art Movement. And this touched me and this reached me, and I spent a lot of time in that room. And we, we made an album in 1988 called 16 Lovers Lane, which we recorded in the city, in Castlereagh Street. That album is, is, is the, the, there's a book that's just come out of the, the 100 best albums in, in Australia, ever made in Australia, and that album's number 12. It should be number one, <laughs> uh, but it's number 12 in the book. Um, and so we, we made that album, and then we toured around the world for the next year. I left Broughton Street, and I, I came back, the band came back, exhausted, after a year of touring, and I moved into a, a house, a flat, in uh, Bondi Junction, living by myself. And I had, in that year away, that year of touring, I'd met a woman, a German woman, who became my future wife. I met this woman 
and I wanted to very, very much be with this woman in Germany and I didn't want to be in Sydney with the band. I wanted to be back there. And while I was in uh, the last days, the last months of 1989, I came back here again. I used to, this was a place, this was refuge for me. And I used to come ha here towards the end of 1989, but it was a very different person that came here at the end of 1989 to the person that was here in early 1988. In early 1988, I was joyful. I was, I thought there was some, I was, it was a golden period. We we're going to make an album. Sydney felt golden and fantastic and it was wonderful to be here. And the Sydney hadn't, uh, Sydney hadn't changed at the end of 1989, but I had a little and I, part of me didn't want to be here. And I'd come up here again and I'd go back to these same paintings. And there was one painting in particular at the end of that room that uh, touched me and reached me enormously. And that was a painting by an artist called Rupert Bunny. And the, the, the painting is called, I think it's called uh, Tritons, or Tritons, however you wish to pronounce it. And it was a, uh, it's a seascape done just on, at the end of the day. And there's people in the water. And there's one man who's looking directly at the viewer. And he's got long hair and a beard. And although this painting was done in 1890, he looks like a full-on hippie. And these, the figures in this painting spoke to me. And there was something in this painting that was unknown to me. Because when I'd walk around the rest of the gallery and I'd look at Sidney Nolan, I'd look at Brett Whiteley, I'd look at Russell Drysdale, I knew that. I knew about that. And it didn't reach me or touch me the way that Sidney Long did or Rupert Bunny did. Because these things, those paintings down there of people with flutes and no clothes on and in nature, dancing with flowers in their hair, that seemed something new to me and something that touched me a great deal. I used to, so I came here and at, right at the end of 1989, uh, the Gobertoons broke up. And before the band did, I came up here with the painting touched me so much that I, I used to bring a, a notebook up here. And I used to come up here on uh, Sunday afternoons and uh, write notes in front of this painting, something I'd never done before. A lot of very interesting people come to art galleries on Sunday afternoons. A lot of people come to art galleries and their first, the reason they come is not necessarily to see the art. A lot of people when I was up here alone on Saturday and Sunday afternoons especially, I'd see people walking around in families and groups, but I'd also see a lot of people by themselves. And it's a certain type of person that comes to an art gallery by themselves on a Sunday afternoon. And these people always fascinated me. And I always tried to guess their stories. I always divorce or women, men in their 30s or 40s alone, who've chosen to be alone, who come to an art gallery on a Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon because they've got nowhere else to go to, but they also want to see art. And in a way, I was one of those people. And so I'd sit down there, there used to be a seat down there, and I wrote, I started to write the impressions that were coming off this painting. Just anything, it was random. And I, I wrote them in, my, in a notebook. And I just, I'd look up and just f phrases, a storyline, inspiration, anything that came out of that landscape, I wrote down on the, the piece of paper. I then, uh, the band broke up. And in early 1990, I flew to Germany. And I, uh, I was back in a very dis different landscape for me in that I was, I've always lived in cities. London, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne. When I went to Germany, I was in the countryside, in a town of 2,000 people, a farm, an hour out of Munich. I was living in a house with, with my 
my girl, my German girlfriend, and some of her friends. And next door were barns. Across the road was were, were people who had pigs. And one day, like a pig escaped, and I brought the pig back, and I got a dozen eggs. And this was a new experience for someone who'd only grown up in cities. And I was writing songs, as I always do, and I came across this chord progression when I was in the farmhouse. And I immediately, obviously, you know, like I was, I was happy with the melody of the song, and I needed a lyric. And then I went to those notes. And those notes, I started to, I started to look at the music, and I started to look at these, these notes that, that I had, and I wrote a song called The River People. And it's a, it's a combination. It's what's on the page. It's new things added to it. But it's the, it's the painting, the images, the ideas that came off that I put into a song. And I wish to play that song in a few minutes. And so I wrote this song and I recorded it. And it, it was on an album, my first solo album called Danger in the Past. And The River People is the second song on the album. At the end of 1990, the album, oh no, at the end of 1991 was the next time I came back to Australia. The album had been out, but I'd done no touring. And I came back to Australia with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, my German wife. And we, we came to Sydney, the only show on the whole I came back to visit my family in Brisbane. And the only show that I did was down in Sydney. And so my wife and I had about one or two days here. And this was at the end of 1991. And we came here because I wanted to show my wife the painting that had inspired the song, The River People. And so we came here and we stood in front of the painting. So this is the third time I'd been back to the painting. And we, it was the only thing that we did outside of seeing friends and playing this one show was to, uh, to stand in front of the painting and, um, and look at it. My wife could see this painting that I've been talking about and that it inspired this song. Then, um, so that's how I came to, to write this song and that's the inspiration that I got from this um, um, painting. And when... Uh, uh, Ashley, who uh, introduced me, asked me to uh, come down and speak to you here today. Um, I asked her, I wanted to talk about this painting, but I couldn't remember the artist's name. It had, I knew it was, I thought it was Sidney Long, because when I was here with my wife in 1991, we bought a poster of a Sidney Long uh, painting, and we took that back to Germany, and for many years it was on the wall in our kitchen. And it was a, a painting that I don't actually see there now, and I couldn't find it on the website. It was with flamingos with long legs in a sort of marsh. And uh, but the other two um, Sydney Long paintings that are up there, I remembered and I saw them on the website, but I couldn't see the painting that I remembered, that inspired the song that I'd stood in front of for hours. I couldn't see it. I, Sydney Long, I, got a, I, I, just, I just didn't know, the, the, no, the, it had disappeared. And I was talking to Ashley, and I was trying, because she was gonna um, um, bring the painting here and have it on stage. And I, I started to describe the painting to her a little bit. And I was convinced it was Sydney Long. And she told me that it wasn't there. She couldn't, find, she couldn't see it. And so I went to the website and I was going through, through things and, and, and through the, the, the paintings there and the artists because I started to think of other artists that it could be. And I couldn't find the painting. And then just a couple of days ago on Friday, late Friday afternoon, I was talking to her again and something about talking about the painting to her I started to get details. Which were the, and, I, and I said to her, there's a man standing there looking 
at the viewer with his hands up and he's like this. He's got long hair and he's got a beard. There's waves, breaking waves, I could remember that. And I said it was, it was on sunset. It was just sea, sea going out, the sky going back around five or six o'clock in the afternoon. And these people that look like lost people, free spirits, were in the water, turning around, looking at the artist. I told her that, and she said, that's more information. Okay, thank you. I will go off now and talk to somebody else here in the building. The phone rang 10 minutes later, and she said, go to your computer. I think we've found it. I went to the computer, I turned it on, and for the fourth time, I saw the painting that I hadn't seen since 1991. And there it was, staring out at me, the man with his arms up in the air, with the long hair and the beard, looking at me again. And I, I, I went back to the phone, I put the phone down, and I went up to the computer. And I, I said to Ashley, I said, that's it. That's, and, and the reason that the painting wasn't there, because I explained to her where it was. I said, you go down the room there. It's right at the end. On the left, there used to be a bench there back in the early 90s where you could sit. There was a bench and there was the painting in the corner. I said, that's where I remember it was. And she said, that's where it's always hung. But Rupert Bunny, there's been an exhibition, a travelling exhibition of Rupert Bunny over the last year, six months, and that's why it wasn't there. It's been away. And it's currently in a, a, uh, a collection house, you know, where they have all the art uh, in suburban Sydney. And when I walked in today, she said she was going to have it on stage, perhaps, so to be, you know, on an easel looking. And uh, when I walked in around 5.30 today, I looked at the stage when I walked through there and I didn't see it. And I was a little bit crestfallen. Uh, and then I thought, I'll just go uh, where it used to be. And there it was. <laughs> and so I saw it for the fifth time. Uh, it, it, uh, it came to me. But another thing, when I was describing the, the painting to Ashley, another thing came to me and that uh, about a year and a half ago, a year ago, I was in London and there's a, uh, a painter who was born in, in um, Edinburgh in the early, early 50s. And his name is Peter Duig, D-O-I-G. And one of his paintings has has, and he, he, he was born in, in um, he was born in Edinburgh, and then he moved to Trinidad with his family when he was a boy, and then he moved to Canada, and then he studied art over in, uh, in London. So he's moved around. And this Peter Duick is, is perhaps, you know, reading some of the press, and he had this huge retrospective, this huge show at the Tate in London. I went down and saw it. And, and this, this fellow is, 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 they call the most influential modern painter. The young painters that are working in figurative art, this man is, is, is the leading figure, the guru. And, and one of his, his paintings just recently, called White Canoe, sold for $11.2 million. I know, art, money, who cares, but $11.2 million. The most money ever paid, paid recently for a living European-born artist. And this man's work, is, I find it fantastic. This is the first artist for many, many years that I immediately am just, just devours me. He's fantastic. It's sort of uh, tropical, it's colours. Nighttime through a forest. Uh, big canvases, exotic locations, exotic people. And there's one painting there that, that really grabbed me. And it was a lot of water, and there's an island in the, the distance, very sunny, Trinidad. Do you know what I mean? Trinidad, bright colours. Sea, 
an island in the middle and then blue sky. And in the middle of the painting, going feral, like long, is a canoe. Canoe motive with, with Peter Dewey. A canoe. And in the canoe is a man with long hair and a beard. And he's looking straight out from the middle of the painting to the viewer. This is Peter Dewey. This is the cutting edge, number one figurative painter in the world. If you saw his work, it would completely knock you out. Hopefully, it'll come here, like some sort of collection. Saatchi and Saatchi, all, that sort of, all those sort of people, all those galleries, love this man. And all the young artists everywhere talk about Peter Dewey. And the artist that he's picked up on, I don't know if it's consciously, perhaps not, but the painting that connects it is Rupert Bunny. A wonderful connection that came to my mind when I was explaining the uh, painting to Ashley. I'd now like to play the song that uh, was inspired uh, by, by um, the painting. And I must say, it's a great privilege to be here today to be able to talk about this and something that happened to me from, from Broughton Street to come up here and see this painting and, and be floored by it and be able to come back um, how many, uh, many years later and play this song uh, in the same building is a great pleasure. So I'd now like to um, play um, the song, The River People. The lyrics of the song, <clears throat> it's impressionistic, okay? It's me fantasizing and putting into these people what I see, putting into a lyric, or no, into notes, and then formalizing it into a lyric in another country. And this is what I got. Down here Everybody said that the river people don't really belong there I came What it's like to be a stranger And divide a town beside a frontier People want your business And a little more I've watched shadows lengthen From a closed door Now mountains are wide Nothing is clearer to the river people than what the others try and hide. You spoke, pledge your throat at the meeting. I could tell that you were petrified. You said the best people can suddenly oppose the side of goodwill. And then it arose Two people Four people cross the floor I saw children run And I wept amidst the uproar Now around here Your stranded face before moonlight The color of the sea You came Up to the house after swimming on sunset In the flattened sea The sky had opened It had gone bust You and I watch the river people swim before us. The sky had opened, it had gone bust. 
you and I watch the river people swim before us. God, oh, na 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 Thank you, and thank you for coming along and listening today. Thank you.